YouTube, Edgar here, and welcome to Artifexy, and here you will learn everything you ever wanted to know about world building, and then some. A dwarf planet is a celestial body that A, orbits a star, B, is roundish in shape, C, has not cleared its orbital path of any extra debris, and D, is not a satellite. According to the IAU, our solar system officially contains five dwarf planets, Ceres, Pluto, Haumea, Makemake, and Eris. However, Orcus, Ixian, Varuna, Quavar, 2007, OR10, 2007, UK126, and Sedna are amongst the literally dozens of objects that could also be classed as dwarf planets. Take home here is that dwarf planets are all over the place. I mean everywhere. Rampant. Meet Ceres, the first dwarf planet. Located in between Mars and Jupiter, her discovery in 1801 was quickly followed by the discovery of the planets Pallas, Juno and Vesta, and by 1899 an additional 460 objects were found in the vicinity of Ceres. So then astronomers were all like, yeah, maybe these aren't planets, and promptly reclassified them as asteroids in the asteroid belt. And justifiably so, I mean they have more in common with each other than they do with any of the other planets. So next time you're mourning the death of Pluto, perhaps spare a thought for Ceres, the OG pseudoplanet. Ceres now is classified a dwarf planet, as it is the only object in the asteroid belt that is in hydrostatic equilibrium, i.e. is kind of roundish. It is the smallest of the five dwarf planets, yet it is by far the most massive object in the asteroid belt. Admittedly Ceres, this would be very cool, but considering the total mass of the asteroid belt is about 4% that of our moons, it is by all accounts a rather poor showing. Ceres is about 2.5 times smaller than Pluto, and has a surface area approximately equal to the land area of India. Its internal structure is thought to consist of a rocky core, covered with a 100km thick water ice mantle, and a thin dusty crust of carbonates and clay. 200 million cubic kilometers of water is trapped within this mantle, which is larger than the Earth's supply of fresh water. And where there's water, there may well be life. Unlike many other dwarf planets, Ceres does not have a moon. Pluto, the second dwarf planet, on the other hand, does have a moon. Well, five actually. Sharon, Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra. But Sharon, the largest at just over half the size of Pluto, makes the Pluto-Sharon system a sort of double planet system? Uh, I mean, double dwarf planet system. Discovered in 1930, Pluto, obviously named after the cartoon dog, was hailed as the ninth planet and held that position for about 70 years. But as far as planets go, it was pretty weird. It orbits on a 248 year long, highly inclined, elliptical, ducking inside of Neptune kind of orbit. Pluto's atmosphere is transient or seasonal, that is, as it moves away from the sun, its atmosphere freezes and falls to the surface, coating it in a layer of frozen nitrogen. This coupled with Pluto's 120 degree axial tilt makes Pluto a very hostile world indeed. Its closest and farthest points in its orbit trace out the boundaries of a very specific region in space. It was in this region that astronomers, just like before with the asteroid belt, began finding many, many planetary objects. One after another after another. But as long as Pluto was the largest of these objects, Classification-wise, all was well in the world. Meet Eris, the fifth dwarf planet. Discovered in 2005, Eris orbits at three times the distance of Pluto and is crucially about 5% larger than Pluto. So just as Pallas, Juno and Vesta were reclassified as asteroids in the asteroid belt, the IAU in 2006 reclassified Pluto, Eris and the myriad of other trans-Neptunian objects as dwarf planets in the Kuiper belt, that aforementioned region of space bounded by Pluto's orbit. Also, they named the once 10 planet Eris after, bear in mind the fallout around Pluto's demotion, the Greek goddess of chaos, discord and strife. And before she was called Eris, the planet's nickname was Xena, so they named her moon Dysnomia after, wait for it, the demon spirit of lawlessness. Get it? Lawless? Now, aside from having a badass naming convention and going all Death Star on Pluto, Eris is a very interesting object, which ironically has a lot in common with its victim. Like Pluto, its orbit is very elliptical and inclined. It possesses a seasonal atmosphere, but interestingly, Eris is one of the most reflective objects in our solar system, second only to Saturn's moon Enceladus, reflecting 87% of the light that hits it. Meet Haumea, dwarf planet number three. Everything about Haumea is intrinsically linked to an ancient impact event. Along with its rapid spin, a day in Haumea lasts about four hours, this collision forced Haumea into a very elliptical shape. The collision is thought to have stripped Haumea of most of its icy surface material and flung it into space, forming its two moons, Hayaka and Namaka. 
Therefore, uniquely amongst Kuiper Belt objects, Haumea is almost 100% rock. Haumea was originally nicknamed Santa because of its Christmas time discovery, and rather cutely, its two moons were given the nicknames Rudolph and Blitzen. Maki Maki, on the other hand, was discovered around Easter and thus became known as the Easter Bunny. The connection to Easter was maintained with the name Maki Maki, taken from the mythology of the Rapa Nui people of Easter Island. At about two thirds the size of Pluto, it has many things in common with both Pluto and Eris, with the tree sometimes being referred to as triplets. Maki Maki's lack of a moon, however, does make it unique amongst the larger Kuiper Belt objects. But just as Eris heralded the demise of Pluto and its kin, there's a smoking gun lurking out there that may plunge the astronomical world into serious upheaval once again. Meet Sedna. Although not strictly a dwarf planet, it does have a lot of dwarf planet properties, one being a crazy orbit, and boy, are we talking crazy. Here is the Kuiper Belt, and here is Sedna's orbit. Madness! It takes 12,000 years to orbit the sun, and out of those 12,000 years, Sedna is only visible to us for about 200 years, shown in red here. So seeing as we did spot it, we must have been insanely lucky, right? Well, maybe, but scientists don't like thinking in terms of luck. Instead, they viewed it as if we had a 1 in 60 chance of spotting Sedna. Or put another way, for every one Sedna we find, 60 may go undiscovered. Extrapolating and applying this logic to the other Kuiper Belt dwarf planets yields the following estimates. It's probable that out there, there are 30-ish Pluto-sized objects, about 10-ish objects two times the size of Pluto, and here comes the smoking gun part, about two to three objects, three, four, or maybe even five times as big as Pluto. That's Mars territory right there. Now, the IAU are gonna have a hell of a time trying to explain away this Mars-sized elephant, should we happen to find it out there amongst all the little dwarf planets. Guys, if you like what you see here in Artifact Scene, click the links in the description to find me on Facebook and Twitter. And if you're interested, hit like and subscribe for more awesome science-based world building. Thank you all so much for watching. Edgar out.